Our next stop is in Hertfordshire and takes us away from the preservation of the oversized into the home of a more pocket-sized collection. Many collectors begin their fascinations at a very young age, sometimes as a direct result of childhood experiences. I'm about to meet a woman who started so young that her collection was a world record by the time she was 21. Hello, Hi, I'm yeah. Jasmine. I'm Lisa. Come in. Thank you. Freelance promoter Lisa lives with her family, which includes all manner of cute little characters, from Squirtle to Pikachu. I just love Pokemon so much. There's just something about that that just brings joy to me every single day. They're on the wall, they're on the landing. If the collection gets to the stand that it starts to come downstairs, and that is a no. <gasps> Oh my goodness. So this is where it starts. Yep, this is the start of it. This is the cutoff point that your mum lets you have it up to here. Basically, yes. So what are all these ones? These mostly are European figures, or as the Japanese call them, kids' figures. Pokemon started life in Japan as a video game back in 1996, and from it over 700 species of characters have been created. There's a lot of memorabilia to collect, and Lisa has held the world record since 2009. Is that your certificate? Yep, that is my Guinness World Record certificate. So how many items did you have at that time? 12,113. You still hold that record? Yes. But you've got even more? Yes. <laughs> I've now got... 16,500 something. That number does not allow to include duplicates. Right. So that's 16,500 unique items. So how many items do you think you've got all together? Oh my gosh, I think if we're including the duplicate trading cards, 25,000. That's a lot <laughs> of stuff! <laughs> it's not surprising Lisa has so many duplicates, given the astounding number of items here. This is <laughs> extraordinary. It's like a sea of Pokemon. Yep. The name Pokemon is an abbreviation of Pocket Monsters, and Lisa, now 26, has spent 17 years hunting down memorabilia generated by these little creatures, from cornflakes to camping equipment. There's just an insane amount of Pokemon merchandise in existence throughout all the countries. It does make upstairs very colourful. Uh, it makes it look more like a toy factory of Pokemon than anything else. This used to be my mother's bedroom. I mean, that some... was very nice of her. <laughs> it was very generous of her, I've got to admit. Um, sometimes I often feel a bit bad about it, to be honest. <laughs> it must mean an awful lot to you to allow it to take over the house, basically. I will collect pretty much anything and everything I can get my hands on. I suppose I am quite fanatical about it, yeah. Mum Sharon's been sleeping in the smallest bedroom for the past 15 years. Quite an extreme sacrifice for a collection that started off almost by accident. Me and my mother had this mail order catalogue and we didn't know what they were. Um, we were unaware exactly what they were. They just sounded cute. Lisa fell in love with them and that's what started off her collection. So, in a way, it's my fault that it's got to the stage it has. It all started with this one here, the Psyduck. Underneath here is just more plush toys. Really? Like if you put your hand yeah. straight through. Feel free to if you, you want to, but yeah, you're just fine. There's more plush toys. <laughs> oh, it's quite comfy. <laughs> I first visited Japan um, solely for Pokemon. You'll find it everywhere you go, from the trading cards to the toys to even toilet paper. Pokemon had been a largely Eastern phenomenon until it was launched globally, arriving in Europe in 1999. When it hit England at long last, I was already quite obsessed with Pokemon, to be honest. This collection seems to have outgrown the house, and with Lisa already the world's biggest Pokemon collector, I can't help wondering, is the house getting too full? What do you think of Lisa's Pokemon collection? Honestly? Yeah. I've got used to it over 17 years. You've got used to it? <laughs> yeah. Getting used to it's a different thing yeah, to really... You, you tend to fall in love with it, and I do. I do love Pokemon now. What do you love about it? Mainly for what it does for Lisa. It's helped her through horrific times when she was at school. I mean, she was severely bullied so badly. Bricks thrown out her head 
her ankles kicked him, had her back punched him. She's been thrown down concrete stairs. But every time she'd come home and she was tearful, she'd just go to the Pokemon, you know, and she'd be smiling if it hadn't been for Pokemon. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I can see why you indulge her collection quite as much as you do and why you're willing to give up your house virtually. It's been her escape. Yeah. Pokemon really helped me overcome the pain that I was going through with the school bullying. I'd come home, Pokemon was there, and I could just enjoy it. There was nothing there to stop me from feeling happy. It was just a huge help through my childhood, and so it's kind of just grown with me. She would love to live in Japan. Ideally, work at the Pokemon Centre, because they're the <laughs> only ones that got so me in the world. There's the, uh, the ulterior <laughs> motive. I think she'd rather work in the Pokemon Centre and live in Japan than win in lottery. Really? Seriously. It's clear Lisa's collection is here to stay, and rightly so. I can't imagine she'll be selling it as a whole anytime soon. There's a few items that I would genuinely love to know the value of. Mm. I've got Pokemon cornflakes at the back there. Pokemon cornflakes? Yeah. I've actually got Japanese ones. He was a lottery raffle prize in Japan. There are only 100 in the world ever made of wow. this one. Wow. There are some real rarities here, but given a third of Lisa's memorabilia is duplicates, which don't count towards the world record title, perhaps we could help her streamline the collection to fund a much-deserved trip to Japan. In Hertfordshire, the future of the House of Pocket Monsters, or Pokemon as the Japanese say, is in no doubt. This collection provided a vital escape for Lisa during a period of bullying at school, and it's going nowhere. It is special, and I'll support her with her Pokemon, even if when I'm old and grey, I'll still support her with her Pokemon, because there's no way she's going to stop it. it. It means too much for her. With nothing to stop her and the house full to bursting, will Lisa ever slow down? Do you see yourself collecting Pokemon for the rest of your life? If I'm being honest, yes. I really? Yeah, I can. Ever since I was a little kid, if I loved something, I never fall out of it. I never grow bored of it. If, I, if there was any cartoons I've enjoyed since I was a child, I still love as an adult. Really? Why do you think that turned into this enormous collection? When the bullying would strike, my escape really was Pokemon. It's hard to really put it into words, but I suppose in a way it is a bit like an additional family, so to speak. And it's always been something to lift my spirits and... Oh, oh, yeah. darling. I can understand, obviously, at the time you needed the collection, but after so many years have passed by, do you still need it? I mean, I don't know if it's a need or want anymore. All I know is that I love having it here. I mean, do you think that one day you will have a family or you'll move out of home and things might change? I have no idea. Whatever the future decides, you know, let's see what the future holds. I'll, so to speak, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Mm. But for now? But for now, I need that Pokemon collection. <laughs> These cutesy Pokemon characters have had a hugely positive influence on Lisa's life. And it's not surprising that from their Japanese origins, they were deliberately designed to be desirable collectibles for fans worldwide. Outside of Japan, the world can't seem to get enough of these furry fellows. And it's the cuteness of Pokemon that's particular to Japan and is part of a cultural phenomenon known as kawaii, literally meaning radiant face, but part of a celebration of all things cute. For many Japanese women, cuteness is seen as a fashion style, with round faces and big open eyes seen as extremely desirable. I've come to meet Clara Wooler, director of sales in the UK for the first of the Japanese toys influenced by kawaii to take the world by storm, Hello Kitty. The first thing you notice are these sort of dish eyes and this big curving form. Kawaii is all about sort of cute and accessible and collectible and big eyes are very appealing because they draw you in and her values are sort of kindness and friendship and, you know, who could not find that appealing? 
Hello Kitty has been around even longer than Pokemon. A child of the 70s, this year she'll be turning 40. She's even older than me. She was named after the cat Alice played with in Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, and she was deliberately designed without a mouth to make it easier for people to project their own feelings onto her. Do you think that Hello Kitty has been revolutionary? She's paved the way for other Japanese style toys in this country. You've definitely seen Hello Kitty as the crest of a wave of things like Pokemon, Tamagotchi, and most lately things like Moshi Monsters. The notion of kawaii was so successful that the British have tapped into it themselves. Hello, Hello. I'm here to see Darren. Just take a seat and Darren will be with you shortly. Thank you very much. I've come to this rather trendy office in East London to learn about the latest contender for the crown of the cute monster craze. Everything about Moshi Monsters is Japanese to the core, from its design palette down to its colours, but the company is 100% British. Moshi Monsters launched in 2008 as a website aimed at children aged between 6 and 14. I've come to meet their commercial director, Darren Garnham, to see what they took from the world of Japanese cuteness. The Japanese have this term, don't they? Kawaii. How, how important was that to the designs of, of Moshi Monsters? Fundamental to start with. What would you say are the main characteristics you've brought over from Japan? Japanese characters really have passion in their eyes, but the cuteness is really, really important. And we've been very mindful to do that here. There's no doubt that innately Japanese styles are not just enormously successful, but they're also incredibly influential. They've tapped into a market and created their own niche, and we just can't get enough of them. Back in Hertfordshire, Lisa is one such fan who's been buying up kawaii-influenced memorabilia for nearly two-thirds of her life. I honestly have no idea how much money I've spent on my collection. I wouldn't even be able to give a ballpark figure, I don't think. It does get very competitive. If I see something Pokemon, I absolutely have to go and get it straight away. It's the world's biggest collection, and Lisa's keen to find out if some of her purchases have paid off, especially as some were bought before Pokemon even hit England. Hi, Kathy. Hi there, Jasmine. Jasmine, nice Hello. to meet you. Kathy Taylor from a toy specialist auction house has agreed to try and value it. So, this is Lisa's Pokemon Centre, as she calls it. Wow, I've never seen so much Pokemon <laughs> in my life. Well, no, and... you wouldn't have. It's the biggest collection in the world. How would you approach, you know, valuing a collection like this? I know for a fact that this sort of thing probably hasn't peaked because it's relatively new. I think it'll have its 20th anniversary next year. But there will be people now that will remember these things as a child. And the earlier products will be in short supply. This is very interesting, isn't it? Limited to 100. Very, very difficult to value, of course, because if you get a few people bidding against each other, it just goes up and up. A rare Pokemon plush toy can sell for over £3,000. There isn't just toys and plushies in here. There's things no. like um, cornflake packets. Yes. Um, we've sold Doctor Who cornflake packets from the 70s, the early 70s, that have been worth hundreds of pounds. They're hard to get hold of intact because people would rip into them. And who would think of keeping it? I mean, if you are looking in terms of getting the optimum value for an item, it can go out of people's living memories. Mm. So it's to do with how many people are actually wanting to purchase something at a particular time. And you may find that the people that have collected this by the time she becomes old, um, that there won't be the people out there. Putting a price on this huge collection could be difficult, particularly if the timing's not right for the Pokemon market. But, like many collectors, Lisa has been thrifty in amassing her memorabilia. Over the years, obviously, I've been given Pokemon as gifts, visit car boot sales, and just kind of snapped up everything I could find, really. <laughs> my most extravagant purchase would be my large Ho-Oh, and it set me back £60, and I have never seen another one for sale. So, have you got any idea how much it's worth? Could you take a, a stab in the dark? I couldn't. No. Really? I don't think no. I could, actually. No, I've got no idea. Well, funnily enough, Cathy <laughs> also said that your collection is extremely difficult to put a value on because it's quite modern. A lot of the things don't come up for sale very often. So, in a way, 
your collection is priceless. Yeah, that's yeah, what we've always said. Yeah. Yeah. We've always said that. Yeah, we? yeah, yeah. We have. always said that. But really interestingly, she said that your collection will probably become more valuable over time. Oh, okay. She said in about 10 or 15 years, it's likely to have reached its optimum value. Most of the younger generation who collect Pokemon on any scale are not yet of an age where they have disposable incomes. These are the people who will push the market price up and help Pokemon memorabilia achieve high values in years to come. Just not yet. What I found really interesting, though, is that your most expensive Pokemon, there were only 100 made. They never come up for sale. She said you could probably pretty much name your price for that. No. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Depending on who's in the market for buying one. Yeah. eBay, here I come. I mean, it could be a little nest egg in a way. If, you know, you found that you had a project in the future, you've got about eight and a half thousand duplicates. So how would you feel about selling them and doing something amazing with the money, like another trip out to Japan? Sounds good to me. <laughs> What's really nice to see is how supportive you are, Sharon. Thank you. Of Lisa's collection. I know. You're the best. So, you. Sayonara. And good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're going to need it. <laughs> it was kind of interesting finding out that it was worth, might be worth, um, some quite a lot in the future. Yeah. But I want to believe that someday, yes, I could be living and working in Japan and I would much prefer to take the whole collection with me. Pokemon is definitely here to stay. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, yeah. I'm quite happy for it to stay. Collectors are driven by nostalgia, and although the generations interested in Pokemon are ageing, they're not yet old enough to be reaping the rewards of a lucrative market. For now, selling duplicates may be the best option for Lisa. To her, Pokemon is like an extended family. They've always been there for her. And I suspect they always will.